Okay guys, we're going to do section 6.3, properties of trig functions. A lot of these are definition based, so I might have you refer back to your textbook a little bit here and there, because there's a lot of nice charts and it's worthwhile to copy into your notes. Uh, for instance, this first big chart here, when you see domain and range of sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent, what I want you to do, it doesn't have to be right this second, but sometime in the next couple of days, you have a long weekend, is to go into your textbook, page 375, and copy in domain and range for each of these functions. That's really going to help us as we start moving into graphing in the next couple sections. So super helpful to do that. Now, what I do want to talk a little bit about, these periodic properties. Now, if you think about sine, cosine, and tangent, as you go around the circle once or twice or three times, you're going to find out that sine and cosine, all these trig functions, they end up overlapping themselves. They have the same value as you go around and around the circle. So take a look at this first property. We might not go through every single one of these, but take a look at the first one. If I say sine of theta plus 2 pi, so sine of any angle plus another 2 pi, should equal sine of the angle. That should kind of make sense. And if it doesn't, let's draw a quick picture over here. So here's my circle. Let's pick an angle like pi over 3 radians. So try to think with me in pi over 3. Try to think in radians. All right. If I take my pi over 3 radians, go around the circle 2 pi, so all the way around the circle 2 pi, and end up in the exact same spot, I should get the same value as sine pi over 3, all right? So the period of sine, if I go around the circle, should be 2 pi, and then I start repeating the values again. And the same holds true for cosine, secant, and cosecant. Those all have a period of 2 pi. In other words, if you go around the circle one full time, you start repeating your values again. Now, tangent, cotangent, they only have a period of 1 pi meaning it only takes halfway around the circle to start repeating the values. All right, now let's take a look at that. Let's see if that's really true. So if I draw a little picture, let's go right below my, my um, writing here. Here's my circle. Let's do tangent. I'm going to switch to degrees because sometimes it's a little easier to think in degrees. Let's do a 45 degree in an angle in here. Okay, so let's think our 45, 45, 90 would then look like this. Okay. Now, if I asked you, where else is tangent one, uh, 1 over 1? So tangent 45 would be 1 over 1. Where else would that happen? Okay, well, let's start experimenting here. If I put a triangle here, same reference angle, it'd be positive 1 over negative 1. Okay, that's not the same. But then, what if I put a triangle down in the third quadrant, same 45 degree reference angle, the tangent would be negative 1 over negative 1, so it would be positive 1. All right, that was a little much. Let's say that again. Tangent of 45 in the first quadrant is 1. Tangent of 45 in the third quadrant is also 1. So you start repeating your values in 1 pi period. All right, if that didn't stick, don't worry. We'll talk about that in class a little bit tomorrow, or actually on Tuesday or Wednesday. All right, this next thing. All students take calculus. This is simply a cute way to remember what is positive and where it's positive. So if I draw a little circle here, and then I label it with this little acronym, all students take calculus. All right. Well, all the A stands for exactly that, all. S stands for sine, tangent, and cosine. All right, what that means is all trig functions, all six of them, are positive in the first quadrant. Sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, cotangent, everything, they're all positive. In the second quadrant, so if I drew a triangle over this sign, you'd notice you have a positive y value, a negative x value, and always a positive radius. So sine would be positive there, but the other ones would be negative. Now, it also means uh, the reciprocal function. So if sine is positive, so is cosecant. All right? And then in the third quadrant, tangent is positive, so is cotangent. And in the fourth, cosine as well as secant. 
All right, so that's not something you necessarily have to memorize. It's just good to know. It's a cute little way to remember what's positive and where it's positive. All right, let's go on to some problems now. So that's some definitions. All right, here's a typical question in this section. And one of the problems you have to do, I believe it's number 52 on page 384, one of the problems you're going to have to use this idea for. Okay, here's what it says. Find cosine theta and tan theta, so you're only finding two values, if sine is 3 sevenths and tangent is negative. All right, so let's think about that. If tangent is negative, all right, let's draw a circle here. If tangent is negative, then it has to be either in quadrant 2 or in quadrant 4. So both of those have a negative tan. Then the other piece of info, you always need two pieces of information here. The other piece of info is that sine is 3 sevenths, positive 3 over sevenths. So of the two quadrants, 2 and 4, the one that has the positive sine value would be the second quadrant. So I'm only going to choose quadrant 2. And then if I put my theta where my reference angle should always go, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? Then I do a little bit of Pythagorean here. So let's see, it'd be 7 squared minus 9, so it'd be root 40. Okay. And then always, always, you got to simplify that up. So it's going to be 2 root 10 for the x value on this side. And because it's in the second quadrant, I'm going to give it a negative. All right. So you have to choose which quadrant it's in. Label the sides. Pythagorean, find the third side. Now I'm ready to answer the two parts of the question. Part one says find cosine theta. So if I look at my triangle, I took all that time to label it up. Adjacent over hypotenuse would be negative 2 root 10 over hypotenuse 7. All right, believe it or not, that's simplified already. Okay, the other part is tangent, tan theta, all right, opposite over adjacent. All right, this time you do have to rationalize. Always, always, forever, get that radical out of the bottom. So it's going to equal, if I multiply by root 10, 3 root 10 over negative 20. Okay, I know I only did one example of those, but they get a little tedious after a few more. So if you could do me a favor, and I just did number one, so if you could try number two on your own, so maybe you have to hit pause or whatever you need to do, try number two on your own, make sure that's filled in when you come to class, okay? And then we can talk about number three if we need an extra one once we get in class. All right, the next thing we need to talk about, more properties. A lot of this chapter is going to be properties, properties, even and odd properties. Here's what you need to remember. Even properties have symmetry about the x-axis. So let me draw a sketch of one above that, the one that we know and love, this little parabola. I would call that an even function. All right? An odd function has symmetry about the origin. All right? So our little cubic is a good example of an odd function. All right? Now let's transfer that to our trig. If you look at my properties here, what you're seeing is sine and cosecant, they go together, tan and cotan are odd functions, so they have origin symmetry. That's going to lead us again into our graphing in the next couple of sections. So sine and tangent, cosecant, cotangent, odd functions. The even function, cosine, and its reciprocal secant, those are even functions. Now the important part about even odd, what we have to think about, I'm going to write it out to the side here. If I know that cosine is even, and I say cosine negative 60 degrees, and it's an even function, it should be the equivalent of cosine positive 60 degrees. That's important for graphing later. And then if I say, let's take one of the odd functions, and I'll write it in there, sine of negative 60, since it's an odd function, it's not equal to the sine of 60, it's actually equal to the negative of sine 60. Okay, and we can show that through graphing again. All right, so if I use some of these properties, the first one, we could probably do it without using an even odd property, right? It says cosine negative 30. Well, that tells me to just go clockwise around the circle, but let's just treat it so we can use these properties and kind of see how they work. Cosine negative 30, since cosine is an even function, 
it's going to equal the same as cosine 30. And then if I think of my circle, 30 degrees, first quadrant, right? Label it the easiest way possible. So cosine would then be root 3 over 2. Okay? So that's just getting used to the even-odd properties. Okay? You can try number 2 on your own then. Okay, the very last thing we're going to talk about in this section. More properties again, some identities this time. Now, identities are something that we could say they always hold true. It's an identity, right? The Pythagorean theorem, we could call it an identity. So, this little box here, eventually it will need to be memorized. Not right away, because at first glance it's a little bit overwhelming, okay? So, the box will need to be memorized. I'll talk you through some of them. For instance, look at this kind of middle row here. Those should all be second nature. Here's what I mean. If you know that cosecant and sine are reciprocals of one another, we should be able to say that cosecant equals 1 over sine. Just like if I said, what's the reciprocal of 2? You'd say 1 over 2, right? And secant is 1 over cosine, and cotan is 1 over tan. So yes, those need to be memorized, but that's not so bad if you look at them. All right. This row here, I'm going to talk about in class and explain why they are true, but those will need to be memorized, as well as what we call the Pythagorean identities down here. Those will need to be memorized, and I'll go over in class why they hold true. Okay, so what I want to practice with you in 1, 2, and 3 here is just once I get these memorized, how do I use them to help me? Okay, so when we get to AP Calc next year, we're really going to want to be able to simplify things so they become easier, and then I can do some of the calc with them. So take a look at this number one. It looks a little bit much, right? Tan 20 minus sine 20 over cosine 20, and I'm not allowed to use my calculator. All right? So let's take a look at all the properties up here. If I'm looking at all my choices, and I'm thinking, okay, which one do I use? How do I know? Take a look at this. Sine 20 over cosine 20. All right? That kind of matches this one, right? So sine theta over cosine theta, the identity says, should equal tan theta. So sine 20 over cosine 20 should equal tan 20, if I just follow the rule there. Then if I rewrite the beginning, tan 20 minus that, well, that's just 0. Okay, so I'm using the properties to make things a little bit simpler, and then off I go. Okay, let's look at the next one. We'll just do one more of these. This one says sine squared of this weird pi over 12 plus um, 1 over secant squared of this weird pi over 12. All right, so I've got to use two identities here. 1 over secant squared would be the same as cosine squared. So again, they're reciprocals of one another, so 1 over secant squared is cosine squared. And then this other part, sine squared, I write it in. Okay, so I used one of those reciprocal identities. Now, if I look at the Pythagorean identities, this one here says sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta always equals 1. All right, here's my theta. Sine squared pi over 12, cosine squared pi over 12, the answer should be 1. So again, simplifying things to make life a little bit easier. All right, so another example I want you to try is on page 384, number 80.